What's the most important thing about you? Based on what people ask each other when they first meet, I'd have to say that the most important thing is, what do you do? For the first part of your life, that question is pretty easy to answer. I go to school. That's what I do. But somewhere along the line, the question changes to, what are you going to do with your life? And all of us have had an answer to that when we were kids. But for most of us, as adults, that answer has changed pretty drastically. And the feeling that we somehow missed out on what we were supposed to do, or worse, supposed to be, haunts many people for years. Because for most of our lives, we got asked the question, what do you do? That it feels like it's the most important thing about us. But in case no one has told you, that is not the most important thing about you. It's not what you do, it's not where you're from, it's not who you're related to, it's not what you've overcome in your past or even what your struggles are right now. There's something that's even more important about you than any of those things. And throughout this video, that's what we're going to discover together. Because here at Community Christian Anywhere, we believe that you were created to experience an amazing and exciting life with the God who made you. And even if you're not sure you believe all we do about God, I hope you'll stick around throughout this video. Because no matter what you think about God, He can't stop thinking about you. He is for you and only has good things in mind for your life. And through this video, we're going to examine how what we think about God can impact everything about how we live and experience this life. Hi, my name's Kelly, and welcome to Community Christian Anywhere. There's a quote that I first heard when I had just begun following Jesus, and this quote sets up what's most important about you and me. And I know there's something about this quote that has the power to turn some of you off, but I'm gonna ask you if you would, and I know this is weird, just read it out loud with me, whether you agree with it or not. It's by an author named A.W. Tozier. He wrote, let's say it together, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. When I say the word God, what do you think of in that moment? His claim is that that's what's most important about you. Now, here's the rest of the paragraph. I wanna ask you to read it, and I've changed some of the words to make them more understandable to our generation. The most predictive, his word was portentous. The most predictive fact about any man is not what he at any given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart believes God to be like. We tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. Now, as you already guessed, I, I agree with Mr. Toast. I think that's what's most important about you and me. I think it's what's most important about our lives and that's what I want us to think about together. It matters how we think about God. Now, with that said, let me give you an illustration of how I see this visibly playing out in people I interact with today in our culture in this country. There's all kinds of ideas about God, and I'm sure, but there are two big ones that I'm often confronted with in this church, in my friends, my neighborhood, and online. In fact, I can think of a conversation I had not too long ago between two people in their late 30s, both who said they were Christians, but they really differed on how they saw God to be. Their conversation with one of them saying to me, hey Ed, you're a preacher, we need you to tell us who's right. Now, I'll tell you, when I hear anything like that, I know this conversation is not gonna go well for me. Most of the time, this is gonna be a big loser conversation where both people wind up angry. The man tells me uh, there's a situation with a friend of theirs who he says is screwing up his life and dishonoring God. And, and what he's talking about is the man was making some sexual choices that are against what's taught in the Bible and he wanted to confront the friend about it because he's in danger of hell with what he's doing. The woman said, but Ed, God tells us we can't judge. And we know that even if what he's doing is wrong, God loves this man and our job is just to love him because that's what God does. Now, let me just break into this point in their story and say, 
And what I wanted to say at that point is that, hey, both of you have some of these things right about God, and you're both missing some important things, and you're just not given the full picture. The, the lady was representing a group of people that really see God as very permissive, completely loving, and completely tolerant of however we live. The man, he's representing a group of people that see God as primary judge, God's harsh, he's looking at us to see how much we mess up, and I know that most of you know people who are just like the two people I'm describing. But because the most important thing about us is what we think about when we think about God, I don't wanna leave you floundering with this question. I want us to spend a few weeks listening to Jesus. How did Jesus describe God? Because how we think about God will determine who we are, what we become, and how we act. What we think about God and a sub part of that, what we think God thinks about us, it'll determine who we become. It'll determine the way we live. It'll determine how we treat other people. It's tough to get life right when you've got God wrong. And I want us to be a group of people that gets God right so that we can get life right. So we're gonna spend the next few weeks looking at one specific description that Jesus gave of God. It's one of the most memorable teachings that he ever gave. He did it in story form. Now, before we hear the story, I, I wanna give you the context for it. This is written in the account of Jesus' life that was carefully researched and written down by a medical doctor named Luke. It's found in the New Testament of the Bible in a book that's named after him, Luke. Here, uh, this is how he sets the context. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Now, if you've heard much of Jesus' life, you might realize that tax collectors and sinners, uh, it's sort of a way for people in Jesus' day to talk about the lowest moral character people in their whole culture. Uh, we hear the word sinners and we know that's not good, but imagine how bad you'd have to be for them to separate you off from normal sinners. Tax collectors, they were the worst of the worst. They were people that had betrayed their own people by collaborating with the conquering government of Rome. They weren't accepted in most cases, even by their families. The sinners were people who were publicly saying in a culture that was dominated by religion, which theirs was, sinners publicly said, hey, we don't care. I don't care what you say the standards are. I'm gonna do what I want to do. So the tax collectors and the sinners are gathered around to hear Jesus. Now. That's interesting by itself, that Jesus, this holy man, has these people around who aren't holy around him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they muttered, this man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. See, the Pharisees were the people that represented in a lot of ways what people thought of when they thought of God. They were the people that publicly identified as good with God people. <laughs> they were the religious leaders of their day and they couldn't believe that Jesus was welcoming these public sinners and traitors. And they could see that Jesus wasn't like these people. He was much more like them in upholding God's standards, just like the Pharisees did. But he hung out with those people. Just to give these religious leaders sort of the best possible thought, I think they're trying to figure Jesus out because what he's doing is like dropping an atomic bomb into what they thought about God. I mean, they're just so confused. And then Luke says, and then Jesus told them this parable. A parable is simply a story, and Jesus was a master storyteller. But a parable isn't just any story with a moral behind it. A parable is a specific kind of story. It comes from the Greek term that's actually two words combined together, para and bolo. Bolo means to throw, para means alongside of. So a parable is taking a story that everyone could understand and throwing alongside it something the teacher wants you to learn. Jesus was so good at doing this. In this instance, Luke says he tells a parable, but he actually uses three everyday stories to throw alongside of the lesson he wants them to learn about the nature of God. And he tells three because it's so important and because it's possible that people might miss it. In fact, there's a chance you could be missing it. But more importantly, there's a chance that you could get it. 
And if we could get it, it could really change everything. And because of that, I want you to hear the final of these three stories Jesus tells in its entirety. You've probably heard these stories before, but I want us to try and listen with fresh ears to hear it for the first time. Jesus started with this story about a lady who had 10 coins. She lost one, she still had nine, but she turns on all the lights, cleans up her whole house to try and find the one. And when she finds it, she is so excited. That's story number one. And then Jesus says, there's a shepherd who had 100 sheep, which Jesus's audience would have thought, okay, rich guy. But Jesus said he lost one. So the shepherd left the 99 to go find the one. Jesus starts with a lost coin, money that matters, but that's not always emotional. Then to an animal, which in their day was more valuable and in some ways more emotional. And then Jesus talks about a relationship between a father and two sons. This is really valuable and emotional. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, Give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, the servant replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father. Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. You never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him? My son, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and is found. And so there's a man who has two sons, and the younger son says, Dad, I want my part of all of this now. The people standing around him would have taken him as saying, Dad, I wish you were dead right now. You being alive is keeping me from all the good stuff I could get if you weren't here. In a culture where family and groups of belonging were everything to them, they couldn't imagine a son saying that to his dad. But then the next line is even more shocking. So the father divided up his property between them. (laughs) What dad would do that? What what does it say about this father? Of course, the rest of the story goes as you'd imagine what would happen with a kid that's rotten enough to say that. He goes off and it doesn't go as easy as he planned. Eventually he's on really hard times and he remembers what his father's are like. 
He, he remembers that even people who are the servants to his dad have it better than he does. So he gets up and he goes home. He has a speech prepared because he thinks his dad will be ready to be done with him forever. And as he's walking home, he's rehearsing this speech. And as he gets closer to home, before he knows it, before he sees his dad, his dad's running at him. Because before he saw his dad, his dad had been watching for him, sees him first. And he jumps up and he runs to the boy. And when they come together, the dad hugs him and the boy starts the speech, but the dad won't let him finish. He calls his servants and he tells them, hey, bring the best robe, give it to him. Put a ring on his finger that says he's my son. Go prepare a feast. We celebrate because he's my son who told me that he wished I was dead. My son who was as good a dead to me because I couldn't be with him. He was lost. He's found. Let's celebrate. So let me ask you, what does Jesus want us to know? What does he want us to think about God? Well, I think for sure I can say that he wants us to think about God as a father. And I recognize for some of you that may make this difficult. Maybe some of you had a terrible experience with your father, but you had a great mother and you, you're thinking, why couldn't he, he just said he had a great parent? Well, that wouldn't have worked in many ways in their culture. And even though the Bible is for you, it wasn't written to you. It was written to this particular culture and it was a very patriarchal culture, which all that means is only fathers could give inheritances and only fathers could restore their children to their place. So Jesus is illustrating for their culture, not trying to offend anybody in ours. But I recognize that too many people today grow up without fathers. I saw a statistic re recently that at least one in four kids doesn't have a father in the home. And so maybe for some of you, you, you don't have a view of what it is to even have a good father. Maybe you had a terrible dad. Maybe you have a terrible dad. But no matter how good or bad your dad is, God's not like any father you know. He's the perfection of all dads. But Jesus specifically used this father illustration over and over. Though it wasn't common, that's not the way they thought about God in that day. He talked about God in those personal family terms. At least 65 times in the four accounts of Jesus' life, Jesus refers to God as a father. And he taught us we should do the same. He said, when you pray, pray like this, our father. Later on, a follower of Jesus who's teaching people how to live the life Jesus described said, you can call God Abba Father. And that was even a more personal term for father. It's, a, it's more like dad or daddy. He's talking about a relationship with a child and their good father. A father who goes out of his way to do the unexpected for you. I mean, you can see the nature of the father in the way Jesus tells his story. Maybe this week, you could just go through the story and note what you see. Here's what I see. He's a dad with a lot of resources. He has an estate with an inheritance for his kids. I could also say that he's a dad who took a sacrificial risk. Was it the best idea to give the son the inheritance right then? I, I don't know, but I can tell you this, right or wrong, it cost the dad personally to do it. I mean, the ash from the son itself showed that there wasn't a relationship with the boy. I mean, not the kind the dad wanted. The, the son didn't want the dad. He just wanted the dad's stuff. So there's a sacrifice of pride and honor, the sense that you aren't getting what you deserve from your child. And when you have to sell it and you divide it between the boys, but you're still alive, it costs you financially. But maybe the dad could see, I already don't have a relationship. I can't guarantee this works, but I'm not gonna hold on to this money to not try. I have to try. He's my son. He's also a dad who's fair. He splits the inheritance, and even though the older son doesn't ask for it, he gives him his inheritance as well. So he wants what's best for both his kids, and he tries to be fair. Another one I noticed is that he's a dad that's known for his generosity. Uh, you remember when the boy comes to his senses? He's hungry, and he thinks, my dad's the kind of man that is so good to people that work for him that they're pretty well off. So I should just go back and get a job from him. I mean, he's so generous. In fact, 
One of the interesting things I learned about this story is it's often called the parable of the prodigal son, and the word prodigal means wasteful or extravagant. One theologian points out that if the original listeners had to pick one character in this story who was wasteful and extravagant, it wouldn't be the boy. It'd be the father. This is actually the story of the prodigal father, the extravagant, generous, prodigal God. He's the one who takes the reckless chance that seems irresponsible to Jesus' listeners. But it makes sense to him because he wants a relationship with his son. He doesn't just want the boy to be at home. He wants to win the boy's heart. So he takes a chance. He's also a father who's patient. Now, this is probably my favorite part of the whole story, but it's the part I know I'd mess up as a dad. The boy goes away and the dad doesn't follow. He doesn't go and drag the boy back. He's so patient. He knew he'd have to let the process play itself out, which also shows that he's a father who's hopeful. He's the kind of dad that always kept the lights on. He never turned the lights off on his son. He's the dad who's standing out on the porch and he's just hoping that his son would come back. Every day hoping this will be the day And so this one particular day when he's out there, and we don't know how many days he's been out there, but this one particular day, he finally sees him a long way off. And then we see that he's a father who's compassionate. He saw his son and didn't get angry. He felt compassion for him. He wanted his son to know how much he loved him. So he runs to the boy and he throws this great party for the kid. He's a father who's proud. You ever been in one of those awkward situations where somebody's kid does the wrong thing and you see the parent gets embarrassed? It's one of the most hated moments as a parent. It's when you feel the sense of embarrassment for your child. But this father doesn't feel this way. I mean, the father is in the middle of his son's worst moment, but he's still so proud of him. This is my son. We have to party. No matter what he'd done, it didn't change the way the dad felt about him. I mean, he cared about what had happened, and there were consequences for what he did. I mean, we'll talk about that more if you come back next week, but he, he never changed the fact that it was, this is my son. 34 years ago, I became a dad, and I'll never forget it. I, I'd been rushed out of the delivery room because they had to do some procedures really quickly, and they told me that Becky, my wife, and the baby, they were both in distress. They set me alone in a chair outside, And I prayed and I waited. And when they came out and they said, Mr. Martin, when they put that little baby boy in my arms, I knew at that moment that no matter what happened for him next, no matter how he messed up in life or how difficult life got, I knew I was gonna be for him because he was my child. Now, I wasn't the best dad then, nor am I now, but that feeling, it's never changed. And if I feel that way, how much more does your Father in Heaven look at you and think about you the same way? You're His son. You're His daughter. So here's the only application as we begin this talk about Jesus' story. Would you be willing to call Him Father? That's really the only application I have for today. It's a pretty simple message. Maybe you aren't sure what that means for you next. That's okay. Would you take a chance today instead of putting energy into the universe or talking to the big man in the sky or to whom it may concern or even feeling as if you're only talking to yourself? Would you take a chance and talk to God, but call him Father? That's where we start. Jesus invites us into a life where God is our good and loving Father who takes care of all of our needs. But this isn't a life that was meant to be shared privately between God and ourselves. Jesus invites us into a family where God is our Father and other believers are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And here at Community Christian Anywhere, we want you to be a part of our community, our family where we are learning together what it means to fully embrace the love and life God has for us while we share His love with everyone always. We want you to be a part of our community here because the church was not meant to be content you consume, like this video you're watching right now, but a community where you can be committed to. 
So I hope you'll take a next step into community right now by texting the words next step to the number you see on the screen. Someone from our team will get that message and we would love to talk with you about what your next step into our community and in your relationship with God looks like. But no matter what you choose to do, I hope you leave knowing that no matter what you think about God, He can't stop thinking about you.